Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. While we assume others will trickle in after lunch, welcome to our session on statistics and inference. And I'll introduce our first speaker, which is Winnie Pulsa. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you find this work that Philip and I did interesting. It is a total different topic than the rest who listen to this, but I actually was a bit surprised that it was accepted. Thank you very much. <laughs> I just thought, let's do something different for a change. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you more about this project a bit later. So I assume I need to tell you a little bit of what is lethal weapons. And then the whole essence of this is penetrating trauma measurement methods. And then we needed to get tissue surrogates, and then we needed to get surrogates for human skin as well. And then um, I'm going to show you a lot of photographs and motivation why we did this and how we got about to it. And then some gelatin block examples that we build, and then we are not finished with this work. We'll have to continue with a few other examples in future. So first of all, what is lethal weapons? They were designed and developed to minimize permanent injury or death, repel or dissuade belligerents to continue with their selected causes of action by inflicting pain and or temporarily incapacitating the individual or a target group. Um, it's easier said than done, but that's another story. It's something that is extremely important that no weapon is ever, ever, ever totally non-lethal. So, and that's why the designers of these weapons have a difficult situation at hand because it must dissuade, it must, because if, if you can catch a beanbag in your hand, it won't dissuade you to continue with what you were doing before the time. So, uh, normally if you define what weapon is, you would say it should do this, this, this and this, but if you define non-lethal weapons, you must say what it must not do. So preferably not kill somebody, preferably not maim them for the rest of their lives, etc. So non-lethality depends on the inherent nature of the weapon as such, the way that the weapon is used, and the vulnerability of the opponent or equipment. Um, the way that the weapon is used, for example, even if it's less lethal and the, the definition is fine, if it catches you in the eye, it can still be really lethal. So the, the, the people using these weapons must be trained not to shoot in the facial area, not to use in the vulnerable genital areas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then if somebody wears a bulletproof vest, where do you actually aim to stop that person? So it really is a complex situation. So if we look at the assessment of ammunition, the accuracy and precision is, of course, extremely important. And then in determining the injury and risk, it depends on the blunt trauma, how much risk there is to the bony thorax or underlying soft tissues of the, the body. And then penetration, if it does reach the person, how deep will it go into the flesh of the human being? Okay, so... <coughs> starting with some pictures. Um, we were asked to evaluate um, these projectiles and beanbags. So, okay, we got around somebody, anybody, anybody that can build us some gelatin blocks. Yes, this is guy, he can do us a few blocks. Then when we actually did shoot the, the shotgun, the penetration which was much further than we anticipated for both the rubber projectiles as well as the beanbags. Um, just for interest's sake, this is how a beanbag actually looks like. Um, and then I think some of them are paper balls and some of them are rubber balls. But as you, uh, I've got another slide, you can see uh, the penetration of this rubber projectile is much deeper than the beanbag, but even the beanbag is much too far too, too deep into this uh, a surrogate of a human body. So this, then we realized, no, 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 we need to look deeper into this. So we looked at different penetrating trauma measurement methods. 
we came across this one. It's a very specific kind of a clay that you can use, but then you'd need to drop a projectile from the top into the clay, and then you measure the, the depth and the, the width. Uh, but this is mainly used for um, ballistic uh, vests. So we've decided we're not going to continue with that. Then we came across this one. It is, is really sophisticated stuff. It is <clears throat> a series of um, physical barriers as well as electronics to measure the impact. But then you can imagine if I come with my 9mm and I shoot this very expensive piece of equipment, it will be frowned upon. So for our purpose, very interesting, but no go. It was also, it's it's not something that you can buy off the shelf. So we didn't even bother. We uh, We decided not to use it at all. Then this was very interesting for us, uh, a force sensor. Um, when you look at skin, the me mechanical resistance depends on the structure of the skin, the network of fibers, also on the different parts of the body, um, the point of impact, the age of the person, the fundamentally of the strain and strain gauge during this such an impact. Um, so we thought it would be fantastic if we could get this. And we almost managed to get the sensor, um, but not the specific one. So we've decided now if we, how are we going to calibrate this at all? So if we don't get that specific part, we also left this option. So what remained for us? So we decided that our tissue surrogate will be ballistic gelatin. No, it, uh, we did an extensive literature study on this. Um, NATO uses 20% uh, oh, oh, oh. That was a bit quick. Uh, NATO uses the 20% concentration of gelatin and they refrigerate it at 10, 20, uh, 10 degrees Celsius. The FBI recommended 10% and they store it at 4 degrees. Um, and then we came a, a lot of truths. The length of curing and the way you cure, even the way that you manufacture, is is must be specified. Um, for example, the different methods. The one is you can. Um, uh, 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 I'll go. I don't think I have time to go too much into it. But the one is you you put cold water towards it, and then you heat it up. And, and, and then you must not exceed 40 degrees Celsius. The other way is to use 40 degrees Celsius water and then just mix it carefully. We decided on the latter. So we, um, some of the literature studies say that the different water types didn't matter so much, whether you use very pure water or tap water. Um, and then what we did use is the the... Gelatin we, we use this from Gelita. It's an international company that fortunately for us sell um, gelatin here, specifically this quality of, of ballistic gelatin. And um, the bloom number is, is important. And then we never exceeded 40 degrees because otherwise the gel weakens the strength and the viscosity. So... Um, and once you remove this block out of the refrigerator, you must use it within 45 minutes. I must say, I think, with even less, especially on a hot summer's day. So then now we get to the, so, so the gelatin was our surrogate for flesh. Now we get to the surrogate for human skin. Um, in this example, they use number one, um, natu um, natural chamois for that layer. And number two, it was a closed cell foam, six millimeter thick. And um, but then, if you look at natural chamois, it, it differs in, in in thickness. It can differ, so um, it is problematic. So we came across this tuftain, or we read about it. Let us rather say, read about it, that can replace the two layers, which is really much much easier. But we couldn't get hold of of tiny in South Africa, we could not. We contacted many, many companies. So if any of you know, I would love to have some thanks. And then Kuna and Papi suggested to use a car inner tube between 1.3 and 2 
millimeter thick, which is a much cleaner method to, to, to substitute the human skin layer. Okay, and here are just a few pictures. Um, okay, the suggested FBI block size is that big, that size, especially if, you, if you're shooting 9mm. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, we'll even use it for less lethal. So you can fasten the skin layer like that, or you can even fasten the block. It doesn't really matter that much. Um, then you need a setup like this. We have the launcher, whether it's by hand, it's better to have it static so that the shots are repeatable. But then you need the velocity measurement equipment, which luckily we have at, at work. And then you need high-speed camera, and then you put down your block there, and then you actually shoot and you measure. Um, now, something that is extremely important is to actually calibrate these blocks. Um, um, you, in order to calibrate, you need a BB gun with velocity between 179 meter per second, plus or minus. So, uh, and then you use a 4.5 millimeter BB steel pellet. Uh, it was a bit difficult to get such a strong BB gun. It's not the first one that you buy off the shelf, or maybe we didn't know how to get it, but it took us a little bit of a while. But now we have one, and now it's much easier for us. And the, the wonderful thing is, because it's a BB gun, we can do the calibration at work. We don't have to go to a, a shooting range to do that. Then for 10% uh, gelatin, the acceptable penetration is between 75 to 94, 95 millimeters. And, but with 20%, because it's thicker and more dense, then it's shorter. And then the norm is to calibrate each and every block before you do the actual testing, whether that be with kinetic uh, bullets or with nine millimeters or whatever. So I've included a few examples for you, just to, you can, it's, it's very clear to see the way that the bullet goes there. And in this block, you can see the path, but here you can see the calibration variation little block, which was nice. Okay, and this is my little experiment during COVID. I've decided that must be possible. So I took the FBI recipe, this was my first attempt, and it worked easily. Okay, and this this was at work. We decided to experiment with a, with a few different variations of the recipe into small blocks. And then the nasty surprise, our we didn't stand our own tests. Um, it should have been, but there's another better picture that I'll show you just now. This is the one. We, this is our threshold, and you can see it's further than that. So, okay, we need to go back to the drawing board. When we were doing this, there was a little bit of gelatin on underneath this, the, the container we used. So I think we could not... Uh, we had we didn't have a proper container to mix everything nicely, so I think two things: uh, we should get a better mixer, we should use less liquid, we should do all sorts of things. But we'll we'll continue with that one. So disadvantages of gelatin blocks: it is fairly labor intensive to prepare, to store, to transport, and to maintain during testing. Um, and um, the organ organic gelatin must be carefully prepared to get the proper, as I say, don't exceed the temperatures, try to store it lower than four degrees, and um, for at least three days, you, you can even, you can keep this gelatin block for three weeks at, easily. Um, there were some tests that, that we came across during the literature study that they even kept that block for six weeks, and it was still fine as long as you keep it at a low temperature. Um, but it's important that you must calibrate the gelatin block. And then once it deteriorates, it's gone, you can't work with it. And also, once you're done with it, it's not so easy to get rid of it because you can't pour, put it down the drain. <laughs> I might have problems doing that. Thank you. So, conclusions. <laughs> We will continue doing this. We want to have a few, I think we'll try to do a concentration of between 11 to 15% next time. 
Um, we did obtain a fairly good chamois, but we didn't use it because we didn't, we failed our own calibration test, so we didn't want to waste the good chamois. Uh, we didn't get the tough tain, so we would love to still look for it. And then we need to uh, use that inner tube as well. And then we actually need to, um, once we've got blocks that are that pass our test, then we, well, we've got new versions of the initial bean bag and rub around I showed you. Um, th those were, we could see there's something wrong. And when we actually took them apart, my, my, my colleague is a ballistic expert, there was too much propellant in it. So even the manufacturers realized there was something wrong with the production. So they, they manufactured the next consignment and they are waiting for us to test those. So yes, that's <laughs> something funny that we play with at work. And we would love to actually build that for sensor because if we could use that, it's much easier to test these things than with the gelatin blocks. But the, I wanted to pursue this option because if you... If, you must be able to do something and you must be able to do it in a repetitive way. So that's why it was important for me to play with this a little bit. And this is just a picture I wanted to show you. If you um, put some ink in front of the, but this is with a nine mil, you can now see the whole wind cavity of this so clearly within, and it's fantastic because then you, although we will never ever validate the, the bullet, but it was still interesting for me, so I thought I must share this with you. <laughs> okay, I think that's from me. Thank you. Thank you, Winnie. Questions from the audience? Um, it was very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, just a question with regards to a place for the gelatin. Have you? Sorry for those of you who are sensitive to that, but um, maybe like pork, pork flesh. Have you considered that? We we did, but we thought it is really a sensitive thing because you can't let the pork die. It must sort of live to do hundred percent, and then we thought no, that will be in your mind. So uh, I wanted to put a few pictures of people being marred by uh, Leslie Eastland and I thought, mm, I'll spare you that, <laughs> it's hectic. <laughs> but yes, we did look at it, but we've decided that no. But the thing is, because the moment that this pork dies, then the, the consistency of the flesh changes a bit. So um, you can put it under, put it asleep and then shoot it a few holes and then afterward kill it or something. But we've decided not to go that way. But it's a good suggestion. That's a perfect solution, yes. Hi, thanks, Winnie. It was a very interesting talk. Um, definitely something different. I was wondering, do you also test um, sort of damage against sort of bone structure? We didn't really. Um, we looked a lot at the damage that, that will be done in different parts of the body. There's a very interesting table that I didn't include, um, the velocity and the parts of the body that will be damaged. But it, it, the, 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 it was interesting that this uh, specific viscosity with the gelatin is, is a fair contribution towards general velocity that the human body can stand given that you need to put this, the skin uh, simulant in front of the gelatin. So the, those ones that we initially did, the bean bag, we didn't put a barrier between. So that's why it maybe went into the gelatin blocks a little bit deeper than we anticipated. But we did discover that the propellant was too much in any case. So it was, it was not usable as is. And the thing is, we had to tell us our client that, and it was not very popular to hear, but if they, if you ask us to do something, we we need to look at the facts. Great, thanks. I just have one more question, unless someone else has. Um, are you trying to replicate the sort of tissue quite accurately, or is there a sort of scaled issue? So, like the the gelatin might be actually more sensitive than skin, so you get a you get a kind of scaling effect. 
there is a bit of a scaling. Um, and as I say, this uh, the different thresholds, for example, if you would just eat somebody's liver, there's a big difference between that and, and when you, you eat the rib cage. So, um, but we've decided that the international norms would be acceptable. And um, that's all we can do. We can't do better than that. Thanks. Um, have you considered entry points at angles instead of directly head yeah, on? It is important. We we um, actually when we set up our test, we need to put it absolutely in ninety degrees or specific angles. It is important, definitely. I'll ask a question. These FBI recipes are they? Freely available to everyone? Freely available. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, I've made a few now, by now. I can absolutely give you the, the easy ways, etc. Yes, they are available. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think we're safe. <laughs> cool. If there's okay. no other questions, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. We'll move on to the next presentation, which is going to be given via Teams uh, from Yaku. Cool. Thanks, Yaku. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm about to start. Uh, I assume that you can all hear my voice and see my slides. If this changes at any point, please let me know so that I can attempt to fix the problem. Um, then I would like to start by thanking the uh, organizers for this wonderful conference, especially for allowing me to give this presentation online. Um, the title of my talk is on the conditional distribution of the mean of the two closest among a set of three observations. And this is joint work with the late Professor Fred Lombard from the University of Johannesburg. All right, so the structure of my, of my talk will be as follows. I'm going to start with a short introduction and motivation for the problem. And then I'm going to consider the conditional distribution of the specific estimated to be used in this case. Thereafter, I will have a look at an application to some data, followed by a short summary. Now, the motivation for this problem is a practical one. Chemical analyses of raw materials are often repeated in duplicate or triplicate. The essay values obtained are then combined using some or other predetermined formula to obtain an estimate of the true value mu of the material of interest. So just to make this a little bit more concrete, um, when working, for instance, with coal, uh, one of the main determining factors of the quality of the coal is something called the ash content. And then uh, in order to study this ash content, what would often happen is two or three samples would be analyzed and the amount of ash within this coal will be determined in those samples. And based on that, we would estimate the ash content of the entire batch as a whole. Okay, so usually either two or three samples are taken. There's a very small number of samples because the, um, the process required destroys a whole bunch of coal in the first place. And secondly, it's very costly and time consuming. Okay, so we're going to study this, this process, and this uh, example also serves as the motivation for the study. Okay, so just to introduce some notation, for example, one way to uh, combine these values using the predetermined formula is as follows. For example, the best of three method involves taking three measurements, x1, x2, and x3, and using the average of the closest two of these estimates as an estimate uh, of these values as an estimate for the true value. The reasoning behind this 
is that it's possible that one of the SA values or one of the X's uh, contains a large measurement error and that one can be discarded. It's unlikely that two or all three of these estimates will contain a large measurement error and we discard one of them in order in an attempt to improve the accuracy of the result. In this talk, we will consider another method which potentially involves three measurements. This method is as follows. Initially, two measurements, X1 and X2, are obtained. If the difference between X1 and X2 is sufficiently small, so if X1 and X2 agree, if I can put it that way, if they are close together, then their average is taken as the estimate. However, if the difference is too large, so if there is a large difference between X1 and X2, then and only then a third independent measurement X3 is obtained. The estimator that we shall denote by mu hat uh, from now on is then the average between X3 and the one among X1 and X2, which is closest to X3. Again, the reasoning is if X1 and X2 are close together, then likely both of them are quite accurate. If they are far apart, where far apart will be made precise below. If they are far apart, then we will assume that one of them contains a large measurement error. We take a third observation and the closest two between X3 and uh, one of X1 and X2 are taken to be the values containing a small measurement error and therefore we use their average in order to estimate the quantity of interest. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some very recent literature references. The usual assumption made is that measurement error is normally distributed. However, Wilson in 1923 mentions that in some instances there are strong grounds for rather using a Laplacian distribution for this case. Uh, also in 1911, Keynes asked the following question. If the most probable value of the quantity is equal to the arithmetic mean of the measurements, what law of error does this imply? Okay, now this is a strange question to be asking. Uh, we would normally be asking this question in reverse. We would say, given, um, given a distribution, how do we calculate or how do we find a, a method to do estimation? He's asking this in reverse. He says, if the most probable value, today we call that the maximum likelihood estimate. So if we use the maximum likelihood estimate to be the mean, what does that imply about our inherent assumption about the distribution? And under the additional assumption that the resulting law of error is symmetric, Keynes showed that if we use the average, that means that we are implicitly um, assuming normality. On the other hand, he also showed that if the question is restated to inquire about the median instead of the mean, so in other words, if we use the mean in order to uh, the median in order to do the estimation, then the resulting law of error implied is the Laplace distribution, which in its standard form has this density. Now, <clears throat> even if both x1 and x2 are unbiased estimators of mu. So if none of them are biased in any way, if everything is just fine, then the measurement, the measurement error attached to each will result in a fixed proportion somewhere between zero and one of unacceptably large differences. In this talk, we investigate the conditional distribution of the estimated value of mu given that an unacceptably large difference was observed. On a purely intuitive level, one would expect that this conditional distribution to be symmetric around zero. And the reason for this is clear. Both X1 X, and X2 are unbiased estimators, and so is X3. Now, this is indeed the case. We will see that the conditional distribution is indeed symmetric. However, the form of the symmetry is quite surprising. For realistic values of alpha, we will see the following. It turns out that if the data are realized from a normal distribution, then mu hat has a bimodal distri uh, conditional distribution with modes, modes both to the left and right of mu. For the Laplace distribution, mu hat has a unimodal distribution around mu. 
Now, let's consider the conditional distribution of the estimator in more detail. The difference between x1 and x2 is regarded as unacceptably large if x1 minus x2 in absolute terms is greater than some r. Now, we can specify an r. The way that we will do this is we will choose a value of alpha such that this probability, the probability of, under the null hypothesis, the probability of, in the usual case, exceeding the value r is alpha for some specified alpha, let's say for 5%. So we can find the value of r, which will only lead to a false signal in 5% of cases. Now, there are two possibilities. The first one, x1 and x2, their difference is less than or equal to r, in which case the estimate is simply the average of x1 and x2. The second case, the one that we are most interested in, is where x1 and x2 differ by more than r. In this case, a third observation, x3, is obtained, and the resulting estimator is x1 plus x3 divided by 2, if x1 and x3 are closer together, or x2 plus x3 divided by 2, if x2 and x3 are closer together. Since in the applications where this is usually used, uh, mu and sigma will typically be fixed and known. We will simply assume that mu is zero and sigma is one. Our interest centers on the conditional distribution of mu, given that an unacceptably large difference has been observed. Now, in order to make some progress, let us introduce the function g. g of x and alpha, we will define to be a probability the probability of a joint event. Firstly, that x1 plus x3 divided by 2 is less than or equal to x. So in this case, we have something akin to a distribution function. This needs to happen simultaneously with x1 minus x2 without the absolute value exceeding r. And thirdly, x3 being greater than the average of x1 and x2. Okay, so this is a sort of a joint distribution, uh, sorry, a joint distribution function, and we will let small g denote the derivative of large g, of capital G. The conditional density function of mu hat, given a unacceptably large difference, can be shown to be the following. This is the density function, the conditional density function, and that is simply this symmetric function of the densities g. Now, if we were to draw this and we assume that the underlying data are realized from a normal distribution, then we get the conditional density function shown by the dotted line or the dashed line. While if we do the same thing uh, uh, under the assumption of a Laplace distribution, then we get this solid line as our conditional density. So what is quite interesting in this case is that normally um, we would hope for something like the normal distribution because it's a very well-behaved distribution and it's easy to do estimation. But in this case, a systems engineer that's looking at this might be somewhat perplexed to see this strange conditional distribution um, under normality and then to see this very uh, nice looking distribution under the Laplace assumption. So let's investigate further. Um, the difference between the standard normal and Laplace distributions are shown on the screen again. Um, now, this is the, these are the assumed distributions of x1, x2, and x3 under um, the, uh, uh, under the null distribution. Okay, so in this case, uh, the Laplace distribution can clearly be, be seen to have a sharp peak at the average, which is zero, whereas the normal distribution does not have as sharp a peak. But here we can sort of see that the normal distribution has lighter tails. That is a little bit difficult to see in this picture, but it's clear that the kurtosis of the Laplace distribution is substantially higher than that of the normal distribution. In order to consider the tails of the Laplace density a bit further, consider table one, which shows the number, the number which we will use as an unacceptably large cutoff, which will make uh, uh, 
the probability equal to alpha. Okay, so if we say we want a false signal 10% of the time, 5% of the time, all the way up to one half a percent of the time, then the cutoff that we need to use for the normal distribution is shown in this column, whereas for the Laplace, it's shown in the right-hand side. Okay, now for, the, for, for an alpha of 10%, these cutoffs are almost identical, whereas for a very rare event, the normal distribution, we will use a cutoff of 2.8, whereas for the Laplace, we will use a uh, cutoff of 3.75, which is uh, now bearing in mind that these are measured in units of standard deviation, since we set sigma to be equal to 1. Um, that is quite a substantial difference. Okay, so now we want to explain why this is the case, why we observe this phenomenon. We now argue that the resulting density is bimodal in the case where the separation between g of x and g of minus x per unit standard deviation is large and unimodal when the separation is small. Now, bearing in mind that the conditional density is simply these two functions added together and rescaled, this sounds like a reasonable assumption. Now, the next figure will show a plot of gx and g minus x for both the normal and Laplace distributions. And figure four thereafter will show the corresponding, uh, sorry, the, the, the next one is for the normal distribution and the one thereafter is for the Laplace distribution. Now, the figures will clearly indicate the amount of separation between these individual functions. For the first one, for the normal case, we can clearly see that if we add this g function and this g function together, then we will get a bimodal distribution with modes both to the left and to the right of zero. So this uh, supports our previous findings. Now, if we uh, change to the Laplace distribution, we can see that there is a substantial difference in the form uh, observed for g of x and g of minus x. In this case, the separation is much smaller. The peaks of these distributions are much closer to each other. And as a result, if we add these two densities up, then we will get back a uniform, a unimodal distribution with quite a sharp peak as we have observed. Okay, now we're going to have a look at an application to some data. As I mentioned previously, the quality of coal is determined in part by its ash content the lower the better okay as a result the price of coal is usually often linked to its ash content typically we will make two determinations x1 and x2 of the ash content of a batch of coal and mu hat is completed as shown above even if both estimators are unbiased estimators of mu unacceptably large deviations would occur in a proportion of batches if mu denotes the contractual ash content then ash contents in excess of mu could attract significant penalties, that is, a lower price than was originally agreed upon. And the next figure shows conditional exceedance probabilities. Okay, now, so this is the probability of um, estimating the, uh, the, 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 sorry, of estimating the true ash content to be greater than x, given that an unacceptably large um, deviation was observed for both the normal and Laplace distributions. Now again, interestingly, we have the solid line representing the Laplace distribution and the dashed line representing the normal distribution. So let's say, for instance, there's a one standard deviation difference that we are interested in. In this case, we had better hope that the data are not normally distributed because, in, because now we have a 25% chance of, ex, uh, of making this mistake up to a level of one standard deviation under the normal case, whereas we only have about a 14% probability of making this mistake under the Laplace distribution. If an enormous amount of data were available, it would be possible to empirically assess the, con uh, the conditional density. 
In the absence of this large data set, we will simply have to be satisfied with the test to decide which of the normal or Laplace distributions is applicable. The next figure shows differences for 199 batches of coal. Typically, a prescribed value of sigma um, is specified. And in the present instance, the prescribed value was 0 0.4. Thus, we standardize the observed differences as follows. We calculate the difference for each batch and we divide by 0 0.4. The resulting sample mean and standard deviation are approximately zero and approximately the square root of two, as we would expect. Now, given these data, we now have to make a determination as to whether the data, uh, the, whether the original data are normally distributed or follow a Laplace distribution. In order to make this determination, we use the standardized komogorov smirnov test statistic, which is given by this form. Without the denominator over here, we would simply be we would simply have the usual komogorov smirnov test statistic, but we decided to divide that by its estimated standard deviation. And for the specific data set at hand, the observed values for Tn uh, in the data set for the calculated test statistics. Uh, are 0 0.27 and 0 0.21, respectively for the normal and Laplace error distributions. And using 100,000 Monte Carlo simulations, the corresponding p-values were calculated to be 9% and 21% respectively. Now, although this is difficult to prove using uh, the methodology that we have, this does uh, lend more support to the Laplacian distribution than to the normal distribution. In summary, we consider the distribution of the mean of the two closest among a set of three observations conditional on the distance between the first two observations being relatively large. The modality of the conditional distribution depends on the distributional assumptions of the measurement error. We show that if the errors are from the normal distribution, then the conditional distribution is bimodal, while when the errors are from the Laplace distribution, the conditional distribution is in fact unimodal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Yaku. Audience questions? Hi, um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I was just wondering, on um, in the bimodal case, the distance between the peaks, is that related to R? Is that um, an ex analytic expression you can derive for that distance? So, sorry, is that a what expression? Um, an analytic expression that you can derive for that distance as a function of R? That is an interesting question. Um, Slide eight uh, had the... Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not... I'm not sure. Uh, okay, well, um, we can get an expression for the distance between the mode of this density and the mode of this density. Um, for the for the normal distribution, it will definitely not be a closed form expression. For the Laplace distribution, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't looked into that, but I believe they, it will also be something that can only be solved numerically. So it is definitely possible to quantify that as a function of alpha, um, but I'm not sure that one would be able to find a nice closed form expression for that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, a question from me, and it, it might be a bit basic. Um, why stop at three? Is that a rule of thumb or is that shown to be optimal? No, this is highly, highly unoptimal, uh, if I can put it that way. Um, you know, this um, problem was addressed because, uh, because it is something that is actually used in certain instances in practice. Um, they, um, 
these uh, these estimators um, that we are considering are definitely not optimal, not in terms of the um, accuracy or their precision or however you want to quantify um, the ability to estimate the underlying quantity. However, this is standard operating procedure for several different types of businesses. Um, and we just wanted to investigate what it is that they can expect to see um, when they implement this method. Thank you. Hi, Yoko. Um, does, I mean, it seems that this approach benefits the seller, right? In this case. One could definitely argue <laughs> that. Um, the, um, normally how it works is um, uh, uh, there's a contractual obligation to have an ash content of no more than some specified number. So you could definitely argue that because of the instability in the estimation procedure, um, it is more likely that you will erroneously conclude that the um, uh, uh, um, sorry, you said it would be biased towards the seller. I'm now arguing that it would be biased towards um, the buyer. Um, let me think about this. Um, look, normally there is just um, if the ash content is measured to be substantially lower, so if the quality is better than contractually um, agreed upon, then there's no benefit to the seller. But if the ash content is higher, so if the quality is worse, then penalties are incurred and those penalties are a function of the uh, amount or, or the proportion of ash in excess of what is contractually specified. Um, so actually I would say the more inaccurate the method is, the better mm -hmm. for the buyer and the worse for the seller. Mm. Okay, no, you're right. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Oh, we have time for one more, if there's anyone. No, we're good. Cool. Thank you so much, Yaku. Thank you very much. OK, cool. Thanks, everyone. Last talk of the session, and I'll hand it over to Stephanie. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm doing quite a silly little project here. Um, as I said it to someone last night, I don't know. I know how to do it, but I don't know why. The question why is it's very daunting, but you'll understand in a bit why. Um, I'll bring it up later. So um, my topic is optimal crop grouping using clustering algorithms with and without outliers. Obviously, um, wondering why it's not working okay they work <laughs> sorry okay so obviously it's by me and then my um co-supervisor which is peter olakami and then michael um dr michael olisanyo anyway so um the motivation for the study came from the second sustainable development goal which was to end world hunger and to promote sustain um sustainable farming and what I'm looking at is a form of precision accuracy, which is now cropping recommendation. And the idea behind this was to help improve that sustainable farming idea. And um, now crop recommendation, if you wanted to know, crop recommendation determines which crops farmers should plant based on environmental attributes, such as the pH of the soil, the rainfall, the relative humidity, and um, say now some uh, soil elements like the phosphorus and potassium and so on. So those are like some of the features that was in my data set, which I collected. Okay, so the problem that we are looking at. So the from the reviewed literature, I um, personally, I like to combine stuff together. So um, from the reviewed literature, I saw that they use clustering algorithms. And this was more to cluster districts together and 
um, and they also classic districts together based on environmental attributes. And then on the other side, they use um, classification algorithms to do this um, crop recommendation. And then you have your target variables, which is now obviously the crops, and then these environmental attributes. So um, I haven't found from the reviewed literature where they actually bring these two together. So my idea was to, from these features that we have now, these crops like apples, bananas, papaya, we um, cluster these crops together like apples and then cluster them into the individual groups um, based on obviously the data that was the other features. So, um, and then you create a new feature, a variable set. So I'm using two um, classification or uh, clustering algorithms. I'll get into that just now. So that was like the main idea behind this. So we are using six different classification algorithms and we're doing the optimal crop grouping, which is that grouping of the crops using the cluster, uh, clustering algorithms. And then lastly, we're doing outlier removal. Okay, so when we look at the methodology, um, we're first going to look at the machine learning algorithms. Now, the classification algorithms now include the naive bias classifier, the k-nearest neighbors, support vector machine, decision trees, retrogression, and finally the stochastic gradient descent. And then for our clustering algorithms, we firstly going to use the dbscan algorithm and then the k-means clustering algorithm. For the dbscan algorithm, we used um, the k-distance graph to determine the epsilon value, and we set the um, minimum spanning um, to seven, which is, if you look at how it's clustering, it has like these um, uh, core points and then boundary points and then you have to set the minimum spanning to say okay for this cluster the minimum amount in this cluster can be that so we also have something called noise points and that's where the outlier detection comes in so noise points in the db scan algorithm is being used to identify outliers in the data set so because they don't form part of the clusters and they are known as noise points. Um, we are using them as the outliers in this data set. So our features, um, this is now the data features from the data set we collected. Um, it was a open source data set from Kaggle and it was collected from India. So there wasn't much going into this, like what kind of apples or stuff. So um, the whole idea behind this data set was just basically for um, one to uh, do this crop recommendation. So, you know, Kaggle um, competitions. So anyway, so we're looking at our first one, which is nitrogen, which is how to with helps with the plant growth of the leaves. And then we're looking at phosphorus, which is to help develop the fruits and flowers and um, developing the growth of the roots. Then we're looking at the potassium, which is how to improve the quality of the harvest. Then our temperature is in degrees Celsius. Our relative humidity is, or the humidity is in percentage. pH of the soil, so for our data set, um, the pH, pH of the soil ranged from 3.5 to, which is a very strong acidic, um, to um, 9.94, which is a very strong alkali. And lastly, we have our rainfall, which is in millimeters. So from our results, so here's our graph. So the first graph, I looked at the cross validation score. I did tenfold cross validation, a tenfold, yeah, tenfold cross validation. So um, you'll see that there's three columns. So our first column here has the original data set, which is the original labeled data set. Then we are looking at the k-means labels and then the dbscan labels. So here on your left, yeah, left, um, you have with outliers, and then here with your right, you have without outliers. So if we look now, um, we can see that the Gaussian naive bias had the best accuracy um, score at 99.5%, then followed by um, for the go um, K means clustering labels, we see that it has a 96.81% accuracy score. And then here we see that we have a 95.45. Anyway, and then we can see that from um, here for the outliers or without outliers, we see the accuracy scores. And this was, I just highlighted the best ones. And underneath here, um, what I did was I did the average score from the different models. So like that. Okay, so if we look at the average accuracy score, we see that there was a decrease actually for the original labels when we removed the outliers. 
um, on the original data set with the labels. Then um, we also see that there was a decrease in the accuracy of the um, Gaussian naive bias classifier. Then um, from here we see it went from 92 to 95, um, but then also the accuracy score depleted as we remove the outliers in the data set. And here we can see there's an increase from the um, 95 to the 90. Um, Eight, and then also an increase in the accuracy score. So you can see that the accuracy, um, the difference has improved, uh, uh, what's the word, um, significantly, yes, from the 83 to 87. Okay, so what we also looked at was the F1 um, accuracy score, and this was just the different models. So I'll just quickly run through them. And like that. So here we can see that the Gaussian naive bias in the decision tree had the exact same accuracy score um, for the original label set. But then here, the best accuracy score was for the 99.79. Um, and we can see there was a decrease in the accuracy from 90 to 88, and or the average accuracy score. And over here, we can see there was an in, um, uh, there was actually a decrease. I don't know why I didn't flip this one over, but there was also a slight decrease in the accuracy score. As you, this is like 69.91, and here it is um, 79.07. Um, and yeah, then there was just an increase again from there, almost that 5% increase. Okay, so obviously, as I said before, we had we found the absolute value for the DB scan clustering at 15. And okay. This diagram here we got from our reviewed literature, and I have no points of reference for the data they used, unfortunately, and I couldn't find it anywhere. Um, so I can't say which features they used, did they use any feature selection algorithms, um, or was the data the same? But what I can tell you is um, if we had to assume that our uh, models were the same, not the models, but the data was the same, we can see that there was an increase um, for the decision tree a naive bias, um, K and N, and super a support vector machine. Um, obviously, I can't say for sure because I don't know what data they were using, and they didn't leave the data open for the user. <laughs> Scary. Uh, sorry. Okay, so um, we looked at the accuracy score of the different models and also the um, performance of these models. So we looked at the seconds. So we can see that. Um, this was the lowest amount of time, the execution time for the different models. And if we just skip ahead a bit, we see that the execution time obviously decreased for um, the models with uh, out, out, outliers, you remove the number of instances that that data occurs. Um, so yeah. Uh, for our conclusion, uh, we evaluated the six different clustering algorithms with and um, with outliers and without outliers and the clustering. Um, from the results, we saw that the Gushner heave bias uh, algorithm had the highest accuracy score um, across the data set and also the lowest execution time. So if you wanted to use um, this a model, it's preferable to use original data set, but if we look at the um, results, we see that the DB scan data set had the second highest accuracy score. So if you wanted to use this clustering of the features, then um, you can use a DB scan algorithm. Like I know a lot of times people um, when they want or when they want more data, uh, or they want to improve their model, they usually like simulate more features. Um, so my idea was more to go on the original data set and try to expand the number of features that's being calculated or being um, targeted to. So yeah, um, conclusion, thank you. And yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. I don't know, my face must be scary. <laughs> no, it looks like you were very confused and I was like, what's going on? Am I not articulating properly? Just my face. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, questions, anyone? Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. A uh, couple of questions just 
technically, how would you, how do you identify an outlier or what do you classify as an outlier? And then secondly, it's not clear, maybe I've just missed it, but how do you evaluate, like you say optimal crop grouping, but what, how do you measure the efficiency of what is an official or optimal or near optimal crop grouping? Okay, uh, firstly, um, outliers, in our case, as I um, stated before, we're using the DB scan algorithm and the noise points in the DB scan algorithm. So when you're clustering the data points in a, that algorithm, you have, as I said, the core point and then you have boundary points. So they're all connected like, um, kind of like a graph, but not really. So you've got like this whole connection between um, the points and then you get points that aren't connected. So they're too far away and um, they don't form part of this cluster. So what I, I um, assumed or I took them as the outliers in the point, but obviously in other data sets, if you have to like have the scatter plot and you've got your line here with the, your data, then you have your outlier point there. So um, I kind of took it in that similar fashion, but not, yeah, I use the noise points as the outlier points because I saw in some articles they did use that. And the second question, um, I, I, use, I went under the assumption that the clusters, because the um, K-means clustering you have to most identify, or you first have to specify K, which is one of its drawbacks um, anyway, but you have to specify K and then um, I used the album method to get that number of K for the individual crop. So I assumed that the optimal crop grouping would be um, the ones that came from that clustering. And yeah, does that answer your question? I'm not entirely sure, but let's, let's go on for now, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's a silly little project here, but... Uh, no, let's say, do you measure it by the number of apples, for example? Like, yeah. What, what is a good, good crop? Yeah, what's the, um, because they didn't give us more information about the crops, like they just said, this is apples, but we all know there's different kinds of apples, green, red, um, if yeah. it's like, yeah, you, you get it. So it would have been nice to have that. So um, that optimal crop grouping was kind of to say, because not all the features Obviously, not all the features for these crops are going to be the same because not all these apples are being grown at the same place at the same time. So it was actually very bad of the um, data collector not to give us more information like, was this the best yield or something like that? So I can't correlate these numbers to what was happening. So, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Uh I saw with your rich detection, it seemed like your values went down when you removed the outliers, and that is sort of counterintuitive for me. Um, yeah, obviously with the outlier removal, um, I have some numbers on this side here, so uh, let me just quickly get to that. I didn't put it there because I didn't want to, yeah, but um, for some of the um, crops, I found that um, for papaya, it was like 73% of them was outliers. So papaya, if you had to plot out the scatter plot, I didn't put this into the data set, but you can see that it goes, it's like everywhere. So it has a very diverse um, growing, uh, it, what's the right words? It can grow in a lot of circumstances. That's what I wanted to say. So um, for this clustering, it's not very ideal. Um, to have these crops in it. And also for, um, let me see, yeah, uh, pigeon peas was also another one. Um, I don't know if you've ever grown peas, but those things will grow under anything. <laughs> so under any circumstances. So um, because they are so diverse, you can't really say, but for more generic crops like apples, bananas, and watermelon, you can m more or less go into one direction and say, go like this. Yeah. Okay. okay. Hi there. Hey. Uh, I think it's a really nice idea to use the Kaggle data set. But was, was the Kaggle competition itself 
looking at this question or was it looking at a different question? Um, it was an old Kaggle competition and the idea behind the competition was just to do that precision farming where you had to do the crop recommendation. So it's, I just happened to stumble upon the data set because from the reviewed literature, I saw there were some numbers and I was like trying to do a reverse image search to like see if I can't find this data somewhere. And I happened to stumble upon this Kaggle data set that was collected or was being used in that competition that time. Great. I mean, if, if it's an old Kaggle competition as well, sometimes there's a lot of comments around what people did with the data. Did you look through that to see what what people were, uh, um, what tools and approaches they were using? Yeah, so I looked through most of it and most of the people, what they did was more like data visualization, showing like um, a correlate, um, the coefficient matrix and so on. So it was uh, some of the people, uh, some of the users were using um, some of the algorithms I was using in my data set or in my study. So uh, that's where I got most of the ideas from because I also reviewed the literature and saw what algorithms they were using to help guide my, my work into that direction so I can have that comparison. But unfortunately, most of the crop recommendation um, papers out there around the system is more um, in line with uh, creating a... Uh, I don't want to say dashboard, but like an application where you can input these values. So I created a dashboard for this where I had like um, the different algorithms and the different, um, say like with and without outliers, what data set you want to use, and also some feature selection algorithms where you can specify how many features you actually want and also the different algorithms. So then on the side here, you could like input the values and it will give you results. Um, but I feel like it's very counterintuitive because we don't know. Okay, personally, I don't have domain knowledge about like farming and so on. So how do farmers actually choose what crops to plant, when to plant, and how to plant it? So ga gaining that <laughs> gaining the dom domain knowledge and getting that access, maybe the question shouldn't be what crops I should plant, but I'm planting this crop, how much should the waterfall be if the relative humidity is this and the pH of the soil is this and so on. So um, gaining that n domain knowledge would actually progress it forward and not just saying, okay, you have to plant this crop. Why? Because of the historical data. Why? Because, you know. Pretty big question. How would you like your work and this kind of work in general to contribute to the sustainable de development goal that you mentioned at the start? Well, um, as I was explaining just now, like more to have like farmers to have that capabilities to have that more automated decision making and not just going with your gut or going with what grandfather said, you know, um, more in the line of what what data advises you to do. So um, a lot of the times I actually follow this one TikToker and he has like cattle farms where he, um, the milk production. So with the same amount of space that his great grandfather had and produced say X amount of uh, milk, he could produce X plus Y amount of milk. And this was just using technology as a tool to say, okay, I have to um, milk these cows. These cows haven't been milked yet because they got like little chips on their ears that scan them. So just that whole system has been automated and it has improved the milk um, production. So having that for um, more static farming, like crops and stuff, that would be more that will be beneficial for them. So, yeah, if it makes sense. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? No, cool. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you.